Yeah, what up, y'all? This your boy, Flame, a.k.a. St. Lou. And remember, God does not need our good works, but our neighbor does, you feel? Before you go, get that extra note. <laughs> Welcome back to Extra Notes Academy. This is episode number 10. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Wow. <laughs> it feels so good to be walking through this project, Word and Water. If you have not checked out the EP, make sure you do so. We are talking about baptism as it's been understood historically by the ancient church the majority of christians that have existed and that exist in the world today and ultimately as it is preserved through lutheran thought so i've really been enjoying it and in this episode we're going to be listening to the last song from the project titled let us remember and before we do that i want to address two things that I've been hearing from you all or some people in the responses or in the comment section. So one of the things is <laughs> this notion that infants cannot believe. So somebody said in the comment section, I don't believe in infant baptism. I believe in believers baptism. And I could just picture them just flexing like, you know what I mean? But anyway, the point is this infants do believe the Bible says so. Let's go to Psalm 22 verse 9 and 10 it says yet you are he who took me from the womb you made me trust you at my mother's breast on you was i cast from my birth and from my mother's womb you have been my god this is a clear example of infants having faith as a gift from God. Verse 9, it says, Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb, you have been my God. It is God who gives us the gift of faith. He does it even for infants. So if you disagree with the word of God, that's between you and God. But babies do believe they can trust. They are the quintessential example of what it means to trust. And the other idea is some people are still struggling to think that baptism is in competition with Jesus. One guy said, I'm saved by Jesus alone. Jesus alone gets the glory for my salvation. And in his mind, he wants to uplift Jesus. Amen. However, there's no need to make a competition between God and God's means. Think about it. We never do this when we see Jesus, the person in scripture, Jesus, the person is fully God, divine and fully man. We never have an issue with God, the father for sending his beloved son into the world to take on human flesh as Jesus. We never say, I can't believe it, God, you use human flesh to save as a means to deliver grace. Only people that have said that historically, they're called Gnostics. And in the biblical times, as the idea was budding and taken off, and as it continued to grow and blossom, many people had an issue with the material world. And they felt like it's beneath God to engage the material, the physical. So they accused Christianity of doing something wrong or evil. So unless you're in cahoots with that idea and you see some issue between the second person of the Trinity taken on human flesh, then you should be okay with God yet again, using physical means to deliver his gifts, right? Not only in the person of Jesus, who's fully God and fully man, no competition between the divine and the material. God himself binds himself to humanity, right? And humans are made from dirt. So God is okay with binding himself to beings that are made from dirt is not beneath him. It's not barbaric or unsophisticated. It's a holy and beautiful thing that God has decided to do. So God says that through water, another physical means he's delivering grace. We should say, Oh, amen. This is what he does. When Jesus heals a blind man, he could have just healed him just out of osmosis. But what did he decide to do? He decided to use saliva in dirt that turns into mud, and then he applies it to the blind man's eyes. And then guess what? He receives sight by physical means. So do we have to put the physical means at odd with Jesus? No, 
That's just an that's a philosophical idea that we bought into from elsewhere and it's seeped into our sermons, it's seeped into our pulpits and our Christian conversation and curriculum and Bible studies. And now we just have this natural reflex to feel uncomfortable when we think about God using the waters and baptism tied with his word, his promise to save. We feel like danger, danger. This is a threat to God's glory and there's no need for that. Now, we'll talk later about how these things have been abused, but you can abuse anything. You can abuse the Bible. You can abuse the local church. You can abuse prayer, right? Jesus talks about not praying as a show in front of people. You can abuse all manner of good things, but you don't get rid of the good thing because of the abuse, right? But anyway, much more could be said. We're going to get into this last song of Word and Water, Let Us Remember. And what are we talking about? Remembering our baptism, what the Lord has done for us in this beautiful sacrament. So let's get into a shout out to Scooty Wop, who's featured on the hook. And uh, yeah, let's vibe out. Let's go. Let us, Lord, let us, Lord, let us remember, let us remember. It's the water in your word. You gave to cleanse us, you gave to cleanse us. Let's bring it oh Lord. Thank you for bringing us close. Try the scuba dive, tried to plumb the depths In the ocean of affections and it left me out of breath God, I tried, tried to stay aligned, perfectly in step Tried to keep your marching orders, but my heart kept going left I said, God, I'm trying to survive, my conscience is wrecked It's a mess, I need strength, try and live this life in flesh This is why you need to look outside, outside of yourself for your help If your faith ain't God and you've been baptized, then you bless You possess victory over devil, death, forgiveness, God's grace Triune God and his gifts To your word I cling Continue in sin By no means Romans 6 baptized in him I rise with him So I'm clean Extra no Let us Lord Let us Lord Let us remember Let us remember It's the water in your word You gave to cleanse us You gave to cleanse us Let us bring in Oh Lord Thank you for bringing us close Can put that old Adam down. Old Adam. Water in the word, make that old Adam drown. Yo, Adam. yo. When I see him swimming back around, back around. spirit working in me. Now we spinning on him now. Whoa. Oh. You say how can water keep your soul in order? I say that's a part of, but it's more than water. It's the word of God in and with the water. Without faith in his word, it's just plain water. Paul taught us by the washing in Titus 3 and 5. Whereby the spirit regenerates us and saves lives. We just lend our limbs, but it's him doing the baptizing. Sweet sacrament where God acts outside us. Let us, Lord, let us, Lord, let us remember, let us remember. It's the water in your word. You gave to cleanse us, you gave to cleanse us Let us bring in, oh Lord Thank you for bringing us close So let us, Lord Let us remember, remember What? Woo. Hey, that one, that's one you put on at nighttime and you just vibe, right? You just think about what God has done for us in baptism. You just bask in it. That's one of my super chill songs. Like I listen to it when I'm just in a certain mood and I just want to thank God. I want to worship him. I want to reflect on the beauty of baptism and how it continues to have application and power and relevance in our lives, you know? So I love that song. Shout out to Scooty Wop again. Uh, but one of my favorite lines of the song, I, the intro line where I said, God, I tried, tried the scuba dive, tried to plumb the depths in the ocean of affections and it left me out of breath. I said, what I say? God, I tried, tried to stay in line perfectly in step. Tried to keep your marching orders, but my heart kept going left. And this is, this is really... 
the core of a lot of the transition that took place in my heart and my mind and my thinking, because there were many ideas that came from my previous tradition, which is the reform camp, uh, Calvinistic camp, in particular, the reformed Baptist version. And, you know, there was a popular mantra that circulated throughout the community. It, it goes like this. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Let me say that again. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. And I took those words to heart. I really wanted to glorify God, but I needed to be more and more satisfied in him to do so based upon this mantra. Now, this mantra didn't come out of osmosis. Um, the pastor who forwards this notion is drawing it from certain ideas from scripture in his understanding. So some people say, man, Flame, why were you following that preacher? I'm like, come on. Now, be honest. I was not following that preacher apart from the scriptures. He had biblical reasoning and I bought into it, as many others do. So believe in the best. I believe that his heart was intended upon steering people in the right direction in terms of feeling things that God wants us to feel, uh, being in touch with motivations that God wants us to be in touch with. All those things are good and natural and amen. But the point of tension is this, these, um, these qualifying words like most glorified when you're more satisfied in him, right? Things like that. So what it does is, it causes you to chase a moving target. So how do you how do you qualify or quantify most or more? What what rubric? What's the what's the determining factor of where you start, how you're developing and where you ought to end up? Right. It's very random and it depends on what preacher is saying it or what's what's his aptitude and expectation of his pupils or his congregants or church members. So that notion of I can glorify God more if I'm more satisfied in him, it sounded like a sweet idea. But then later I realized that I'm chasing a moving target. I don't, I, and, and I just began to try to clamp down more and more and more and more on my sincerity, my affections for God how genuine and pure my motivations were. And it just became this internal deep dive of trying to so fine tune my affections with God's because I innocently and genuinely wanted to glorify him more and more. I wanted my life, my ministry, my music, everything about me to, to display God's bigness. Right. And it sounds like a sweet idea on the surface, but once you get more and more into it, you realize how unhealthy it is. And another thing that makes it unhealthy in my estimation is this. If you're telling me that I can glorify God more by something I do, now you're blurring the lines between the law and the gospel. You're blurring the lines between my ability to praise God or appease God or or show him enough of something that I've done that will impress him and then he will get more glory, more shine. So it's a very tricky place and responsibility that you put the listeners under when you demand upon them, you want to glorify God more, you better be more satisfied in him. And then you ask the question, what does that mean? How do I become more satisfied? Does that mean I'm reading my Bible more hours? I'm praying longer hours? Um, I feel more of Jesus like feelings like it's really difficult to define. And the thing that really made me sit back and think about it was as I was learning the reality that God does not need our good works, but our neighbor does that broke into that fog and that mist and all of that ambiguity. And it brought clarity. And it makes me think about this passage where it's um, Psalm 50. Let me just go there real quick so y'all can hear from the word of God, my thinking. This is Psalm 50, and this is verse 12. It says, if I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. 
Selah. I love that. God says, if I were hungry, I would not tell you for the world and its fullness are mine. So God is saying, I don't need anything from you. You can't offer me anything. So you don't need to try to glorify me more and more by being more and more satisfied as if you're giving me something and then I'm rewarding you for what you're giving me. And that idea became overbearing and it just really drained the life and the oxygen out of my soul, spiritually speaking. So I, I just couldn't do it. And then it made me think about the reality that the most I can glorify God is being in Christ Jesus. There's no more glory I can offer to God than to be covered and hidden in Christ. I glorify God the most when I am in his son. So guess what? Since I am in Christ and he's forgiven me of my sin and I'm righteous because of his son's righteousness, a foreign righteousness, one that's not my own. Guess what? Even when I'm not satisfied in God, I still glorify him. Why? Because I'm in the son. My sins are forgiven. So all of my good deeds that I do anyway are filtered through Christ, right? So any good, that I bring to the table is only good because I am in Christ Jesus. It is Jesus alone whom the father looks at and is pleased with. And if I am in the son, then I glorify the father. So there's, there's no amount of satisfaction that God is waiting to see from me that would cause him to be glorified more and more and more. So, I submit to you that that is an unhealthy idea, though the motivation and intention, I'm sure, is pure and, and meant to glorify God and to, and to encourage people to enjoy God, to encourage people to, to bask in the sweetness of God because he is satisfying, right? The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. So I know that the intention is meant to highlight God's sweetness. So I'm not being critical in the sense of, um, the person is mean or evil. I'm just saying the idea falls flat when you push on it because I cannot glorify God any more than I can by being in his son, Christ Jesus. Amen. That's all I'm saying. That is it. So take that to heart. And I pray that it lands on your ears in a way that I intend, which is really to help us fine tune the sweetness of the gospel and to push out when the law tries to mingle itself with the gospel, we need to keep those things separate. Luther says, right? He says that this vertical righteousness that we receive from God passively, we ought to keep that separate in its own jurisdiction from the righteousness that we perform horizontally before one another as we serve our neighbor. So let's, let's keep those things separate. <laughs> God does not get more glory for me as I try more and more to get into the affections of what I should be feeling and thinking and in my motivations, because the Bible says that the heart is wicked and deceitful continuously. Who can know it? Genesis six. So it's impossible for me to plumb the depths of my own affections and to know the, 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 the pure motivations that are springing from my heart. I can't see all of that stuff. <laughs> Only God can. And I thank him that I'm forgiven for all of my impure motives. I thank him that even my best efforts are seen as good because I'm in the sun and it's not based on the quality of my performance or my ability to conjure up enough of uh, sincerity or pure motivations. I'm only seen as righteous and my works are only acceptable to the father because I am in the sun. Amen. Amen. Let's get into this section right here, though. All right, real quick. So if you want to learn more about ancient Christianity as preserved through Lutheran thought on important topics like baptism, the Lord's Supper, justification by faith alone, the law and the gospel, and so many other beautiful confessions, make sure you check out cph.org. There you'll find so many Christ-centered resources that'll help you grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and the hope of the gospel. You will find books, Bible studies, devotionals, and some of my favorites like The Spirituality of the Cross by Gene Veith, 
Has American Christianity Failed by Brian Wolf Mueller, to name a few. You feel me? Make sure you go to cph.org or you can go to cph.org slash flame and you will see a list of books that I've curated that I've read personally that have helped me out in my walk. So make sure you go there, tap in, grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. You fed of this um, teaching from Robert Kolb. The book is titled Teaching God's Children, His Teaching, A Guide for the Study of Luther's Catechism. So this is what it looks like right here. I will put the description in the description section below and you guys can get this book. It's amazing. It's helpful. It's well written. And I think you'll enjoy it. So what we're going to do is we're going to start on page 117. It's not very long, but I think it's going to be very impactful, however. So let's get right into it. Chapter six, to receive God's word in many ways is so much better. God's word determines the way it is. Thus, Luther could write in his Galatians commentary that only the word of God can inform us what God wants to do and what pleases him. The word makes us certain that God has thrown away his anger and enmity against us on the basis of the gift of his son who died for our sins. The sacraments and the power of the office of the keys reassure us. For God would not have given us these precious gifts if he had not been serious about his forgiveness. He delights in overwhelming us with these proofs of his mercy and love for us. Yes, God gives in abundance. It makes him happy to do that for us. And I'm thankful for that characteristic in him. Amen. This overwhelming evidence so delighted and thrilled Luther that he could never get enough of it. In preparing a text for the confession of believers to their pastor in 1529, Luther had the pastor ask the parishioner why he wanted to receive the sacrament on top of the absolution, which he had just received. Now, absolution is its own category that we will talk about. So stick around. Um, But basically, it's the sweet reality that God uses means, again, people to declare the forgiveness of Jesus on us. And so you receive those reassuring words from the minister. And then this person wants the sacraments as well. And Luther is addressing that. The parishioner is to answer that he desires the grace and strength which God's word with the sign would give. The pastor is to reply by asking whether absolution has not already bestowed forgiveness. The parishioner retorts, so what? I want to add the sign of God to his word. To receive God's word in many ways is so much better. Yes. So, yes, I've been absolved by the man of God. Yes, I received the forgiveness from what Jesus accomplished on the cross universally. Yes, I received the forgiveness from private confession and absolution just from me talking to God. And yes, I receive forgiveness from the sacraments. All of this grace on grace on grace on grace because God gives in abundance because he cares for us. Luther thought so not only because God's word is in and of itself good, but also because we need its power so much for its power comes to kill and to make alive to bury us as sinners and to recreate us in the image of him whose innocence we receive through a joyous exchange for our sinfulness. It annihilates sin and sinner and despair. It creates something new order out of chaos, life out of death, resurrection out of crucifixion. Beautiful. That's exactly what the word of God does. (laughs) This teaching is based upon a, presupposition that many of us in Western culture have trouble sharing for most of us still live under the influence of ancient Greek philosophers who more sharply differentiate the spiritual and the material and made the spiritual of a higher order than the material. We talked about that moments ago. The Hebrews, by contrast, believe that the sharp differentiation should come between the creator who played little or no role in the thinking of those philosophers 
and the created order, both spiritual and material. Luther caught that vision and therefore understood that the biblical writers were revealing that God acts through selected elements of the created order as he accomplishes his will. Also, his saving will for us. God has harnessed his recreating word to Christ's flesh, to human language in oral and printed form, to the sacramental elements, to his people as they convey Christ's benefits through the word in its oral, written, and sacramental forms. This is the many ways God delivers his word. The Wittenberger theologians added the sacraments to the first three elements of the medieval catechism because they believe that it is good to receive God's word in so many ways. They believe that baptism frames all of life and that it needs to be recalled and its process repeated in daily confession and absolution with all the support which lies at hand in the word which comes in the Lord's Supper joined with our Lord's very body and blood. The use of the sacraments does not diminish other uses of the word in public proclamation and general sharing and private meditation. The sacraments enhance all other uses of the word. Amen. Now I'm going to skip over to this next section, page 119, buried and risen with Christ. Let's go. Baptism frames the whole of the Christian life and brings the action of God to the heart of our lives. For in baptism, God has transacted the joyous exchange to our sinfulness for our Lord's innocence. So we get his innocence, he gets our sinfulness. That's what baptism handles that exchange. He has used baptism to put us back in the right place in relationship to him. And through it, he has given us new identities as his beloved children. Baptism is, in miniature, a complete picture and a decisive act of birth, of discipleship, of death, of resurrection. It is the Christian life. Baptism is all of the Christian life. Amen? What is baptism? Luther answers simply, it is not just water. It is water seized by God. For a special purpose. Baptism is the initial step which God designed in the making of disciples. Christ commanded his disciples to make new disciples first by baptizing them and then by teaching them. Matthew 28, 19. Sometimes we teach first and baptize later. Amen. But God's sovereign action of recreation is better demonstrated when the tiny infant who can do nothing for himself or herself, receives from God the blessing of new life. Beautiful. Even though water seems insignificant, it is of great value because God has instituted and commanded its use. For baptism in God's name is an action of God himself, not the human creature. Even if human hands perform it, large catechism, baptism, 8 through 10. This is important because that's a stumbling block for us. We don't understand in the way Christianity has been handed down that simply because we use our limbs, our legs to walk up to the baptismal font or the pastor uses his hands to dip you in the water and pull you out or to pour the water or sprinkle it. It's a stumbling block for us that if someone else's limbs are being used, that is still God's work. Why? Because we struggle to see in the Western culture that God uses physical means. But once we acknowledge that, then we can say, oh, yeah, that's how God does it, right? Let's keep going. Luther presumed that God operates in that way. He takes what is insignificant, foolish, and weak in this world as the means of demonstrating and affecting his power. That is the theology of the cross. Beautiful. What did Paul say? God takes the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. What is most foolish than God using water to deliver his gifts or God changing the world through the crucifixion of his son? These things seem ridiculous and laughable and foolish to the onlookers. But in those realities is the power and the wisdom of God. So we should not doubt when God uses things that seem off-putting and awkward to the world. We should say, 
That's how our God does it. He likes to flex. You feel me? <laughs> Thus, Luther sharply rejected those who defame baptism and ignore God's word in it. Their silly babble, which questions how this mere water can help the soul, disregards the fact that God has staked his honor, power, and might on baptism. The believer can therefore be confident in the power of this word of the Lord, the gem which he has placed in the setting of water. Lord's Catechism, Baptism, 15 through 17. Luther proceeded to ask, what gifts or benefits does baptism bestow? He used Mark 16, 16 to answer the question in the small catechism. It saves. Peter has also said the same thing. Baptism saves. 1 Peter 3, 21. It does not do so as though it were merely some outward washing which removes dirt from the body. It's not the symbol of that kind of cleansing. It saves because it creates a clean conscience before God. And that clean conscience is possible because baptism unites us with Christ in his resurrection. Risen with Christ, Peter comments, we can stand with a good conscience before our heavenly father. Baptism brings that assurance. We can now stand before God with a good conscience, with a clean conscience, because that's what baptism has delivered to us. Amen. I love this definition of what it means to be saved. Check it out. Being saved means, Luther wrote, deliverance from sin, death and the devil and entry into the kingdom of Christ. Life with him forever. Lord's Catechism, Baptism 23 through 25. For it grabs us out of Satan's jaws and makes us God's children once again. It takes away our sins and strengthens us in faith. Paragraph 84. Beautiful definition of what it means to be saved. In constructing the order of baptism for evangelical churches, which he composed in 1523, Luther wrote a prayer which recites God's merciful use of water through history. He preserved Noah and his family. He used water to drown hard-hearted Pharaoh with all his host. He rescued Israel by leading them forth on dry land. He had his own son, Jesus, baptized in the Jordan. This groundless mercy which God exhibited of old, Luther's prayer implores, should be given to the one being baptized to deliver the blessing of true faith, a drowning of sin, a separation from unbelief, preservation, dry and secure in the holy ark of Christendom and service to the name of God throughout life. Beautiful what baptism does. In Hebrew, to save is not only to rescue, but to restore to a place of safety in the wide open spaces. Beautiful. There's this holistic reality that takes place when we're being saved. It's not just to be rescued, but to be restored to a place of safety in wide open space. The freedom in that. Beautiful. Salvation affects a return to Eden, to its peace. Woo. Beautiful. Baptism restores our righteousness by placing us once again in an Edenic relationship to our father. We are his children once again, as we are able to think upon and respond to his baptismal word. We respond with love, with a trust which relies and depends on this saving God who has spoken to us directly in our baptisms and there transformed our identities through the work of of Jesus. But how is that possible? We want to know how can water produce such great effects? Luther replied, the word does them. As Paul wrote to Titus, here the Holy Spirit is at work. The early church had but one washing of regeneration and renewal, baptism. There the Holy Spirit recreates us or delivers us through a new birth. John 3, 3 through 8. He did that again by associating us with the person of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and thereby making us heirs of eternal life. Titus chapter 3, verse 3 through 8. The word recreates a relationship with God 
which we describe from our end as a relationship of faith or trust, even infants trust. It is the very first thing they learn. They do not trust in God in the same way adults with conscious knowledge of him do. But infants do not establish the relationship. God does. When he tells them that they are his children, they are. They can take their time to realize it in the way in which we realize things as we grow a bit older. Beautiful, right? So God initiates this relationship. And isn't that what he does with all of us? All of us are born dead in sin, shaped in iniquity. Paul says in Romans 3, no one seeks God. No, not one. Who, right? So we're not looking for God. God pursues us. He gives us sight. He gives us new life. Same thing that he does with infants, right? That's what salvation is. It's God's word. But his word has established the reality of their status as his children, in spite of the absence of conscious commitment. For the word of God is powerful enough when uttered to change even a godless heart, which is no less unresponsive and helpless than any infant. That's right. Even in adulthood, that's what he does. Even in the adult response to baptism is not a command to God or a deal we strike with him. In baptism, he accepts us as his own and commits himself to us. His recreating word enables us to draw strength and comfort from itself. When our sins or conscience oppress us, I must retort, but I am baptized. Baptism's promise assured Luther of his salvation. I love that. Luther would say, I must retort, but I am baptized whenever he felt overwhelmed or depressed or oppressed in his conscience. He would remind himself that he is baptized. Large Catechism, Baptism 44. The word accomplishes its purposes. We must heed Hebert Genderson's warning that we do not devalue baptism into a mere ceremony which symbolizes what God does in the heavenly realm. God acts with this water through his word. We must also avoid making baptism into a magical ceremony, which we can use to fend off God by telling him that he did his bit for us once and we will live as we please because we have the magic of our baptism to cover our willful sins. No, that is not what baptism is. It is not a magic trick where you can sneak your way into heaven or sneak your way into doing whatever you want to do on earth. That is to not trust in the word of God that he delivers through baptism. Baptism must be understood in the light of the distinction of the law and gospel. That's a whole nother topic. We'll get into that. Stay tuned. <laughs> baptism is gospel language. The arrogant or secure sinner cannot understand baptism and will misuse it as a license to sin. Therefore, we must refuse to talk about God's good gift of rebirth to the person who is living life old style in sin. Baptism is language that only broken sinners who have given up on themselves can understand. That message can be expressed through several metaphors, for water has rich meaning in human experience. That is probably the reason God used the baptismal water sack to deliver his children into new life with him. Water causes growth and nourishes life in every kind of living creature. I love that. You see, water, as we experience it in the world, always gives life, nurtures life. It's a part of life. It's what it means to be alive. So it's just so consistent that God would use water to say water cannot be separated from our concept of life. Water commits his children to a lifelong regimen of bathing. The feeling that we are dirty with our shame and sin is relived by turning back to God's cleansing and healing action in our baptism. For there he washed out our fatal wounds and he poured the healing salve of his blood bought love into our lives. Luther compared our baptism to the preparation of a bride for her wedding. God readies us through this bath for our bridegroom to whom we are joined in the bath itself. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. 
And I love that just in this life, we have to bathe. We get this sense eventually that we are dirty, that we need cleansing again. In baptism, oh my goodness, it is, is it not that? Is, is that not what God is doing through his word attached to water? Constantly cleansing us, constantly giving us life. Beautiful, beautiful Lord. But when we use the spit and polish of baptism to clean up people for God, he transforms their lives, their identities, and their appearances. That can be dangerous. Parents who bring their children to God's gift of new life dare not forget this gift or treat it forgetfully or frivolously. It is blasphemy for parents not to cultivate the relationship with God into which they have introduced their children by bringing them to the font. But they are failing to take God's commitment made there seriously. I love that. So when we baptize our infants, we have to continue to cultivate trust in what God brought to them in their baptism. That's the responsibility of the parents, the godparents, and the community of saints. Amen. Baptism makes a lifelong enemy for the child who is baptized. Woo. For Satan is pledged to combat God's children. Thus, baptism is serious business. The church which makes such an enemy for a person must prepare itself to stand by that person in the fight. The fight for life. Beautiful. We got to hold each other down, y'all. Baptism. Luther wanted us to remember as he composed this small catechism is above all a drowning of everything we are apart from God. It is the avenue through Christ's tomb to new life. To say that baptism is a washing away of sins is too mild and weak, Luther wrote in 1520. Baptism then signifies two things, death and resurrection. That is Full and complete justification. This should not be understood allegorically as the death of sin and the life of grace, as many understand it, but as actual death and resurrection. For baptism is not a false sign. Selah. Luther took with utmost seriousness Paul's pronouncement that we are buried with Christ through baptism and are thereby raised to new life in him, Romans 6, 3 through 11, Colossians 2, 11 through 15. There is a double aspect to this death and resurrection. In the Father's sight, we die as sinners and are placed outside his view. We no longer exist as sinful rebels from his point of view. Instead, we have been raised to enjoy the innocence and right placidness with Christ exchange for our sinfulness at the same time in our horizontal relationships the impact of the peace which we know god has given us in baptism causes our defensiveness and dread to die then we rise to new life life which more and more accurately reflect the image of god and sounds the clear note of his harmony into the lives of others beautiful so as we are rightly oriented in our baptism, we live that out before those around us and we can demonstrate to them what it means to be a good friend, a good pastor, a good wife, a good husband, a good student, a good teacher, because God through his spirit, that he delivered this peace and this joy and this freedom in Christ in our baptism allows us the power to move into the world and to function rightly and to do good. For our neighbor. Beautiful. Therefore, Luther regarded the whole Christian life as a daily baptism. If baptism is being used, the lust of the flesh are being battled and suppressed. Large Catechism, Baptism 65 through 68. That is a word of law. The resistance is finally not broken through such a word, but it is overcome and reversed by the gospel that God's commitment to us in our baptisms is sure, ever ready to renew us in the practices of his children. Luther suggested that baptism gives believers enough to study and practice for their entire lives. Trusting in God's baptismal promises delivers Christ's victory over death and Satan. Such trust delivers forgiveness of sins 
in God's grace. All of Christ and all of the Holy Spirit's gifts are received through such study of baptism. In baptism, Luther concludes, we receive the priceless medicine which swallows up death and saves our lives. Lord's Catechism, Baptism 41 through 43. Beautiful. I love that. In baptism, Luther concludes, we receive the priceless medicine which swallows up death and saves our lives. Praise God for what he has done and continues to do in our baptism. Selah. Wow. 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 <laughs> Man, 10 episodes discussing baptism, discussing the EP word and water, and we're only just beginning. So many more beautiful topics and teachings and truths to unpack right here at Exynos Academy. So tap in. There's so many episodes to just dive into and let people know that you are a student at Extra Notes Academy. But anyway, more to come, y'all. Stay locked in. More to come. Trust me. Y'all already know. This your boy Flame, a.k.a. St. Lou. And remember, God does not need our good works, but our neighbor does, you see. <laughs>